Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, so yesterday we uh, were discussing this. So we started with this uh, formula J equals to Okay, so this is, uh, you can call it the Landauer formula. And uh, this transmission function is given in terms of uh, uh, this uh, Green's function. Okay, uh, so were there any questions uh, from yesterday? No. Okay, and uh, then we said that uh, for this uh, 1D chain, uh, so we were looking at this 1D chain. Uh, with uh, the, spring con the spring constant at the boundary is K prime and everywhere is K and then masses are m1, m2, mn, and then the, there's a left path at tl, and there's a... Okay, so for this particular case, I mean, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this Green's function is, a, of course, an n cross n matrix, which is, uh, uh, which is basically inverse of this Okay, so it's inverse of some uh, matrix. Uh, so it's an cross n fully filled uh, matrix. And uh, then, but this gamma L has only, uh, basically only one non-zero element. It's uh, completely, uh, um, all elements except the left corner is non-zero. And this is a matrix, a n cross n matrix with only the bottom corner uh, non-zero element, right? So therefore, if you, uh, if you just do gij, gamma, jk, whatever, and then take trace, you'll find that it reduces to basically, uh, this becomes just uh, gamma one, gamma n, omega uh, square, and then g one n, omega mod square. Okay, so only one uh, element of the Green's function is you have to evaluate, right? And then we said this element uh, is basically given by uh, one over k uh, determinant of uh, some matrix. And uh, this matrix is uh, uh, given by, okay, so this is the matrix. So this matrix, I think I called it Z. And, and this matrix is basically something which looks like uh, A1 minus sigma prime minus one, minus one, A2 minus one, zero, zero, zero. Uh, Okay, so if you have a uh, chain of uh, size uh, five, then this is what the matrix would look like. Uh, and this, uh, uh, so in general, sigma could be different at the two ends, but let's take them to be equal, uh, which means I put gamma one equal to gamma n. So then this sigma is the same at the two ends. And uh, uh, this elements a i are just two minus uh, m i omega square by k. These are the, uh, this uh, matrix elements. And sigma prime was equal to, uh, okay, so this is uh, what we uh, had. Okay, so now then I say, and then uh, this delta n is just determinant of this matrix, right? So delta n is uh, determinant of delta n. And uh, then I said that uh, this determinant can be written simply as delta n is equal to one uh, into some uh, matrix, uh, let's call it D, 
and then uh, again a two cross two vector. It's like that, okay. Uh, and uh, then this uh, two cross two matrix, so this is a two cross two matrix, uh, is basically uh, can be written as, yeah, so this, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, inverse of this uh, matrix and then the uh, this element. Yes. So normally the cofactor of this. Right, yeah. Uh, right, yeah. So if you look at the cofactor of this, it's 1. Because, I mean, it's a tridiagonal matrix with all 1. And these are all 0. So it's just a product of 1. Okay, so that's the simplification. Uh, okay, so, uh, right, okay, and then, uh, okay, and uh, so this, uh, then we said that this uh, two cross two matrix can basically be written as product of uh, this kind of matrices, T1, T2, to T2, Tn, where each of this Ti uh, is equals to Ai1 uh, minus 1, uh, 0. Okay, so just to give an idea how this comes, I mean, basically it's a simple idea. I mean, if you look at uh, this matrix, let's say A1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, A2, minus 1, 0, uh, and so on. And the last guy is A, N, and minus 1, right? So if I look at determinant of this matrix, uh, okay, maybe it's right, better to write a finite matrix. Okay, so let's just write till f uh, 5 or something. Okay, so if I, uh, I can clearly write this as uh, determinant of this is uh, A5 into determinant of this smaller matrix, right? Which is a like similar matrix of size 4. So it's like, uh, maybe I call it uh, D4. So D or D1 to 4, or let's call it D4. Okay, and uh, then, uh, then I should look at this one. So it becomes plus 1. And I cross this out and look at determinant of what is remaining. And that you can see is uh, basically uh, minus 1 into determinant of this uh, 3, D, uh, D1, 3, right? So it basically becomes minus D3, right? So D5, determinant of this matrix is uh, determinant of A5 times uh, this uh, D4 minus D3. Okay, so D3 is determinant of this matrix. D4 is determinant of this matrix. Okay, so this is the idea. So in general, you can just write Dn uh, is equal to An Dn minus 1 uh, minus Dn minus 2. Right? And then this you can write as, uh, I mean, it's useful to sometimes to write it in this matrix form, like Dn n minus 1 is equal to. Uh, Okay, so if you look at this thing, uh, the first is a n d n minus 1 minus d n minus 2. So it gives me the first row, gives me this equation. And the second row is a trivial identity, it just says d n minus 1 is equal to d n minus 1. Okay. So uh, that's basically how I got this uh, t relation in terms of product of uh, uh, matrices. Last? 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 Uh, in which matrix? In that matrix. Is an, an. A, it should be an minus. No, I mean, that's definition, but I, I know, an. Why an minus 1? Because a1 came with minus 1. a1 came with? a1. a1, right, yeah. Okay. a1 minus 1 and then minus 1 if an. Uh, okay, so the, that's how this, uh, that's how this whole thing comes. Okay, so it's really simple. Uh, okay, so now uh, the, uh, I had given a homework that uh, if all these t's are equal, which means there's no, uh, all the masses are equal, then it's, uh, then, uh, okay, so ordered chain. Uh, ti's are all equal. So this, uh, this d2 cross 2 mat uh, matrix is just t to the power n. 
And uh, then from this, we are supposed to find that uh, uh, basically V1n is equal to uh, something like this, right? Uh, is this right? Right, yeah. Okay, so for, I mean, for Q going to zero, you can see this should be n plus one, which is probably true, right? Because if you have matrix two, one, uh, two minus one, minus one, two, uh, if you take determinant, this is just three. So that's two plus one, three, right? And if you take uh, some matrix like this, uh, and if you take determinant, you'll find it's uh, four. Okay, so this you can check. But did anyone work this out? Determinant? No. Okay, but uh, but I, I won't work it out. It's uh, you just have to uh, like uh, diagonalize this and uh, solve right. The other way to solve this is of course if you look at this matrix, if A's are all equal, uh, then uh, you just uh, notice that D n equals to A D n minus one minus d n minus two. So this is a difference equation and uh, from Deepak's lectures you know how to solve this, right? So basically you just have to, uh, so you just have to try a solution of the form d n equal to let's say z, uh, z to the power n. You plug it in, you get some solution equation like z square minus a z plus one equal to zero. Uh, find the roots and then uh, write the solution as d n equals to a z plus n plus uh, b z minus n, and then put initial conditions, because initial conditions, we know, like for small matrices, we can work out the determinants. Those are the initial conditions. And then if you solve, we'll just uh, get this. Okay, so this I just leave it as an exercise. Uh, okay, so if you work, you get this d1n, and then of course, uh, you can just multiply this out, and you can get, you'll get some uh, expression for delta n, right? Okay, so uh, if you uh, do this, finally, what you get is uh, some expression for delta n. Uh, so you put in all the sign and uh, do some simplifications. And you basically get that delta n is A of Q into sign in Q plus B of Q times cos of n. So basically, you have some sign in Q, and then you, if you rearrange, obviously, you can rewrite it like uh, like that. Uh, and uh, then we just uh, plug it into, so we now have G1n uh, is this form, and we plug it into this, uh, this formula, uh, uh, this formula here, and then we need to do an integral over Q. <coughs> okay, so... <coughs> Uh, okay, so what is Q? Like, uh, I should define what is Q. So uh, in the original problem, I just had omega, right? Because everything, the whole matrix was in terms of omega. And this Q is just defined as uh, uh, omega square equals to 2k by m, 1 minus cos Q. Okay, so if you look at the <coughs> uh, this uh, matrix elements, so this was 2 minus, uh, so the matrix elements for the ordered case is 2, minus m omega square by 2, by uh, k, <coughs> right? So if I, uh, uh, so I just call it uh, cos q or 2 cos q. I mean, I just define q like that, right? And uh, so it's a transformation from omega to q. Uh, of course, omega, I said, can go from 0 to infinity. Uh, so in principle, uh, q could also take uh, imaginary values, okay? In which case, it becomes cos hyperbolic q. <laughs> okay, so uh, so this is a change of variable, and if you uh, invert it, you just uh, get back this, which you also notice is actually the dispersion relation for phonons in this system, right? So uh, if uh, if omega is within the band of uh, the system, then uh, then this is a real solution. If it's outside the band, then this becomes uh, uh, like imaginary, and it's cos hyperbolic. Q. 
Okay, so uh, okay, so then we have this integral. Uh, okay, so delta t by two pi uh, zero to infinity d of omega, uh, and then omega square <coughs> and uh, delta one, and this is as this. Right, so a q okay, maybe you have to put a mod here. Okay, so this is the uh, exact formula, and uh, in general, uh, it's d difficult to do this integral, right? I mean, so omega and q are related by this transformation, so it's difficult to do. But uh, uh, okay, so the what you notice is that uh, so what is the can we change from omega to q? Okay, so if we do the change of variables from omega to q, we can convert it into an integral over uh, the modes, uh, the uh, vectors, q, uh, the wave vectors. And there, what you notice is that, uh, like I just said, that if Q is outside the band uh, width of the uh, spectrum, then this becomes imaginary. And so you get some sine hyperbolic and Q here, cos hyperbolic and Q. So this then decays exponentially, right? So this has become extremely small. So therefore, uh, this uh, range of frequencies, at least for large n, should just depend on, uh, just be restricted to the bandwidth. Okay, so the maximum frequency you can get is, of course, uh, uh, yeah, uh, root two k by m, right? So uh, for large n, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the omega range is uh, omega uh, max is basically uh, root. Let's do. That's the maximum frequency you should go up to. Okay, so you put this uh, maximum then, uh, omega max, and then con you can now convert it into a, a Q integral, right? So just change from omega to Q, and uh, so you'll, uh, you have, you'll get some d omega by dQ uh, into uh, dQ. Right, and uh, the range of uh, integral now becomes zero to uh, pi. Okay, so at q equal to pi, you get the band maximum, right? Q equal to pi is minus one, so it's the maximum, okay? So uh, now you have to do this uh, finite q integral. And uh, okay, so now if you, if you, you can of course plot this, this is some transmission function, right? You can just plot it as a function of omega, uh, t as a function of omega. Okay, for finite n, you can just plot this uh, here. And what you'll find is that it uh, basically looks like uh, some function uh, which has some uh, oscillation uh, peaks and uh, then uh, kind of goes to zero. <laughs> okay, and if it's, uh, if n is small, okay, so let's say this is the cutoff frequency, omega uh, c equals to uh, two root k by m. That's the bandwidth. Uh, but if it's small system size, then you can have transmission if even outside the band where it goes around. But uh, as you increase system size, you'll find that this becomes sharper, okay? And the other thing you see is these oscillations. And basically, it's the <clears throat> like when you send uh, uh, sound through a uh, system, it will have uh, the, the transmission function will have peaks at the resonant modes of the system, right? So the resonant modes of the system are uh, basically this, uh, some frequencies. <clears throat> and at those values, you'll have some peaks. And uh, so this is what it looks like. Okay, so now when you increase n, what you'll find is that this, uh, maybe it looks like that. <coughs> and as you keep increasing n, you f see large, huge oscillations, and, uh, uh, and then uh, it uh, decays exactly at uh, this point, okay. So now we have to, uh, so at large n, then you, ca you expect that we should be able to do some sort of averaging to get a, I mean, so that this function is given by some uh, smooth uh, fu uh, function, okay. So, uh, so I won't prove this, but basically uh, there's a result that you can prove <clears throat> that if you have such oscillating functions, Um. 
This is equals to n going to infinite limit. Uh, so the basic idea is that uh, this whole thing should be replaced by some uh, single function. Okay, so uh, I mean, you expect that finally uh, this should give the answer, okay. And what you can show is that this is basically given by dq. I mean, uh, okay, I mean, what can you guess like what it should be in the, if I want to throw away the oscillations? I mean, this, uh, for example, I mean, simpler cases like sine nq, uh, n square q, dq. Uh, this again looks like a very oscillating function, right? but you know, we know that it can be maybe just half, something like that, right? If when, if you just have, have kind of average it. Okay, so something like that happens here. Okay, so let me just write the answer. Okay, so this is what you get. Uh, so now there's no n. So in the uh, thermodynamic limit, you just get a finite answer. You, you have to do this integral, okay. Now this function is z1, g2 are basically known. I mean, you can, uh, if you work it out, if you know a and b, you can just work it out in terms of this function. So you can just do the integral. And then uh, for this particular example we are doing, you can work out the integral. And uh, the f uh, final answer that you get, okay, I won't write it down. Uh, or maybe I will write it down. Okay, maybe maybe I just write it down. So if you do the integral, uh, then for the case where k prime equals to k, okay, so this is the, the case that was uh, solved by these people, Ryder, Lebowitz, and Lieb. And in this case, you get uh, current. Okay, it's not very instructive, but anyway, let me just write. Okay, so this is just a number which depends on uh, the masses, the spring constants, and the uh, coupling at the the coupling constant, uh, the friction constant at the yeah. Okay, uh, so obviously we don't see any system size dependence. So this is completely ballistic transport, and uh, uh, there's no Fourier's law or anything. So, uh, okay, so I just sh showed you that using this uh, method of Langevin equations, you can recover the result of this uh, people who obtained it using a completely different method. Okay, now, uh, you can similarly, uh, if using this, uh, I mean, using the same approach, of course, you can also work out what is the uh, temperature, right? So temperature also, you'll get some similar expression. So the, uh, I, I won't write it, but again, you can imagine you, you just do the integrals and you'll get something again in terms of the Green's function, okay, at every site. And then again, you can do a similar calculation and so that the temperature is constant and given by uh, mean of the two ends, okay. Sir, yeah. Ballistic means it doesn't depend on system size, okay. So phonons are going, they're just going through without any scattering. Huh? What is? Oh, that's delta or something else. Uh, sorry, that's not, that's four. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the result uh, and maybe, uh, okay, so the one other thing that I want to say is, uh, okay, so I, yesterday I said that uh, in the quantum case, uh, you have to model the heat bath, right? And so one popular model of heat bath is something called Rubin model. Where the heat bath itself is a, uh, this uh, a harmonic chain, uh, which is kind of semi-infinite. And then you connect the system uh, you want to study to this uh, semi-infinite chain. And on, on this uh, end, you have another such uh, long chain, okay. So these are the heat baths, okay. And basically, uh, the heat bath itself, you prepare initially at some temperature TL. And uh, this bath, you prepare at some temperature T right, okay, at some time. And then you connect the full thing and let it uh, reach a steady state, okay. And because these baths are infinite, 
you'll find that uh, this uh, system actually reaches a steady state, okay? So these guys have to be infinite, okay? Now, uh, if you have such a setup, uh, what I told you is that you can uh, kind of eliminate the bath and you, what you get is a generalized Langeva equation, right? And this you can do either quantum or classical. And uh, basically I said that you get an equation of the form mv dot equals to minus, uh, so these are the deterministic force. Uh, and then you get something which has some memory. And then there's noise. Okay, so this you can do uh, both classically and quantum mechanically. Okay, so it's exactly the same treatment. The only difference is, uh, so even the kernel, if you have the same kind of reservoir, the kernel is also the same. Only difference is in the noise correlations. Okay, so in the classical case, the noise correlations is just uh, proportional to temperature. In the quantum case, it's proportional to some cot hyperbolic beta h cross omega and so on. Okay, and that you can imagine in the classical case, uh, p square by 2m, expectation is kvt by 2, but in the quantum case, it will, this will, you'll get, get some cot hyperbolic beta h cross omega, right? So that's the reason the noise correlations have to be different if you want to recover fluctuation dissipation, okay? So that's the idea. Okay, so now, uh, so therefore, if you do this calculation uh, with this particular bath model, whether in the quantum or classical case, uh, and supposing your syst uh, there's no disorder, so then this and this are identical, right? The system and bath are the same system, it's just an extension of the system, okay. So then what you expect, and uh, if you work through this calculation, you'll uh, recover that. What you expect just physically is that the transmission should be what? What should be the transmission function? T of omega. See, I mean, I have a chain like that, I connect it to another chain and I've connected on this chain, okay. And transmission means I send phonons at some frequency. Uh, now, uh, what will be the transmission factor? If it's, a, if, if it's the same system, right? So transmission will be one. So, I mean, if you want to calculate transmission, normally the way you do it, you write a solution, it is over ikx plus uh, deflected it is over minus ikx here something here and something here, right? And then you'll, uh, so here you'd put it to your transmitter, it to your IKX, okay? And uh, if this is different or there's some boundary defects or something, then you expect some transmission. But if it's the same system, then of course there's no reflection and transmission is perfect, right? So you should expect tau equals to one, okay? So if you do this uh, business of, like if you actually do all the ca calculations, you'll find actually it's exactly one and, uh, and then let's just see what you get from the Landauer formula. Okay, so, uh, so for this particular model, uh, the current is given by, uh, okay, let's write the uh, general uh, case or, okay, let's write the quantum case. Okay, so one by two pi. Uh, Okay, this is the formula, and now, uh, so uh, what I said is this tau omega is, uh, is is one, right? Because it's perfect transmission. So, uh, so okay. So here, let me just put for this Rubin bath model. Uh, so this tau omega is one. Uh, okay, and then it looks like this uh, thing will diverge, right? So, uh, so can you say what? Uh, how do I fix that? Huh? Yeah, but this is some, uh, okay, this, uh, I don't think this will, okay, yeah, this will kind of suppress because this has uh, one by e to the power beta h cross omega minus one. Uh, and at large frequencies, maybe it uh, goes down as one over omega, but uh, even then it won't uh, help. See, in the, if you take a, a high, for example, high temperature limit, I mean, you would just get T omega, D omega at zero to infinity. So this seems it, you get an, in it's, but it's infinite finally, the, but the current can't be infinite, right? So what is the, right, yeah, so what is the cutoff? 
But I mean, what is the maximum frequency I can, I can have? See, the phonons are coming from this guy, right? And this has a finite bandwidth. So obviously, the cutoff is 0 to uh, omega c, the same cutoff that I had earlier. Right, and both the, both the, now the system and this guy they have both have the same bandwidth, right? But uh, you can't; these guys are not sending phonons uh, outside that bandwidth. So I should put a cutoff, and then I'll get a finite answer. And uh, yeah, no, oh, sorry, sorry, one, one, perfect transmission, right? So one. You can um, do. You can recover it from all this determinant and all that, uh, which is like very complicated. Finally, you just get one. But uh, physically, you know, it has to be uh, one, right? Okay. So now I uh, just want to mention that uh, if you uh, so in the quantum case, you put one and you have some integral. Now, supposing you take your temperature difference to be small. Okay. This uh, so this is T L, and this is T R. Then, if you take the temperature difference to be small, then you expect uh, you can expand uh, around t, and uh, you will get uh, so this then should be proportional to delta t times some specific heat, right? Okay, so then uh, what you will get is j by delta t. Uh, so this is for small delta t. If you compute this, uh, you can then do the integral exactly. And what you get, the answer that you get is pi square uh, kb square t divided by 3h. OK. So yeah. No, 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 sorry. What I'm saying is uh, this, I, I'm just taking, uh, let's say, f left is uh, t plus delta t. Uh, and f right is just f t, and uh, then it's just del f del t into uh, delta t. Right. So I take, take out delta t, then I have to I get some del f del t, whatever some one over e to the power something square and all that. Then I do the integral. One can do the integral explicitly, and uh, at the end you'll get this answer. Okay. So this is something actually uh, that people in the quantum uh, uh, like transport and uh, they know well. This is called the quantum of thermal conductance. Okay. Okay. So probably more uh, many of you have heard of like uh, electron conductance being quantized. Uh, there, there's some formula e square by each or something. Uh, similarly, you have a quantum of thermal conductance, and this has been measured in uh, experiments on uh, nanowires and so on. Okay, so this is uh, okay. So this is not our main uh, interest here. Uh, we, here, of course, we are just so this is ballistic transport, right? It's a systems where there's no scattering. Uh, it's just uh, things are going. You don't expect Fourier's law, and uh, conductivity is not well defined. Conductance is well defined, right? So it's just. Uh, J over delta T, that's the conductance of the system. It doesn't depend, it doesn't scale with system size. Okay, so this is uh, conductance is uh, what you measure in the experiment, and that's a well defined thing. Okay, but what we want to understand is to, uh, now uh, look at the disordered case and see whether uh, you get a, a finite conductivity. Is there a system size dependence? Okay, so now we look at the disordered case and uh, then. This, uh, <coughs> Uh, okay, so there uh, we can't uh, do so uh, such explicit calculations, uh, but uh, okay. So first, let me just state uh, some results, and then I'll try to argue uh, how you can understand them. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, so we consider two kinds of baths. Uh, one is uh, white noise. Uh, uh, where, uh, and let's say k prime equal to k, and okay, so let's consider these two cases uh, and uh, see what happens when you put disorder. Okay, so. Okay, so let me just first say what you see if you just plot t of omega as a function of frequency uh, for the first uh, bath model. So, uh, okay, so for the ordered case, uh, we saw something like uh, 
uh, some function like that. Okay, now when you put uh, like the masses are disordered, then uh, what you see is that uh, okay. So this is with some system size. Uh, so let's say this is uh, some n equal to maybe ten particles. Now if you put uh, twenty particles or something, you find that uh, okay. So it changes a bit, and it looks like that. Okay, so this is n equal to twenty. And if you put 100 particles, it maybe looks like like that. And uh, then like that, OK. So basically, you see that the transmission keeps, uh, like uh, there's no transmission at almost all frequencies, OK? And uh, it gets smaller and smaller, except at sm very low frequencies, things are still transmitting, OK? And uh, for this other model, you see something similar, except uh, Okay, so in this case, what you see is that, okay, so in the, uh, when there was no disorder, then we said it's one, right? Completely one and then zero. So it was like that. Okay, now uh, when you put in disorder, what you find it still starts from here, uh, and uh, then maybe it uh, does something and goes to zero. And then if you increase the dis uh, system size, it goes like that, like that, like that, okay. So in both cases, uh, in the thermodynamic limit, you'll see that very small fraction of uh, frequencies are going through the uh, uh, wire, okay? Most of the frequencies are just uh, reflected back, okay? Uh, okay, so now how do we understand this? So why is this happening? And uh, this is uh, there's something called uh, Anderson localization, and uh, this, is, uh, this is what you're seeing, okay? So basically, if you take a, uh, if you take a harmonic chain like that, And you ask what are the normal modes in the system. So normal modes means you just have to uh, like uh, you look for solutions which are where all the atoms are moving at the same frequency, right? So put you just put time dependence as e to the power i omega t, and then you'll get some equation like minus uh, m uh, l omega square. So, uh, if, so, if, so we just try a solution of the form x n equals to e, e i omega t. Right. So then if you put it in the equations of motion, uh, so now forget the reservoir, I'm just looking at an isolated system, okay? So, the, so because normal modes are defined for isolated system. So then you get uh, UL equals to uh, minus K to UL minus Uh, okay, and then you can forget the minus. Okay, so this is what you get. Okay, so uh, now this basically, uh, okay, maybe I'll just, uh, uh, okay, I'll just rewrite it in slightly different way. So it's in the form ML omega square UL. Uh, where phi is the whatever force matrix. Okay, now supposing I just define some new variable psi of L. Okay, then uh, you can see that this can be written as uh, Okay, so this equation, if I just change the variables uh, using this uh, uh, then it basically uh, takes this form, okay. So now if you look at it, so this phi is basically some matrix which couples nearest neighbors, and uh, this is an ordered matrix, but now, okay, sorry, this is ML and MM here. Okay, so it's still a symmetric matrix, uh, but now random, right? Uh, okay, now if uh, if you think about it, this is exactly like the problem of uh, electrons in a disordered potential, okay. So uh, maybe some of you don't know, but so usually uh, this localization is discussed in the context of electrons, 
And there, uh, typically, you have to solve some equation like I del T of Maybe the simplest version is just uh... okay. So this is like electrons moving in a random potential, and uh, this is the randomness. Okay. Now, if you want to find eigenstates of this, then you just put uh, this as epsilon psi x. Okay, and uh, you look for uh, solutions of this equation, right? So now you can see that this and this are exactly in the same form, right? Uh, like mathematically, they are exactly the same uh, equation. Uh, yeah. So therefore, uh, I mean, localization is basically it's a wave phenomena, and because phonons are also waves, uh, irrespective of whether it's classical or quantum, you still have local, uh, this same phenomena physics here, okay? So uh, now, uh, if you just uh, so you can't find the solutions analytically of this equation, but you can just uh, diagonalize your uh, matrices and try to find the eigenstates numerically. And what you'll see is that for the ordered case, uh, eigenfunctions are let's say on a periodic lattice they would look like that. E to the power i q x are the eigenfunctions for the ordered case. And once you have disorder, what you find is that uh, states are like very different. Okay, so they typically look like that. Okay, so there will be still n eigen mode, uh, normal modes of uh, like n solutions of this equation, but uh, each of them will look like that. Okay, so the another mode might look like that, and so on. Okay, so you'll have n modes which are localized at different places. Okay, and now uh, given such a system, uh, it has all these normal modes which do not interact with each other, right? It's a non interacting system. So, in terms of normal modes, it's completely isolated, uh, non interacting uh, oscillators. And what you're trying to do is when you try to send heat, you're trying to uh, excite this mode, okay? But this mode ex decays exponentially with uh, distance. So it's uh, like if you do something here, it can't uh, transmit it across, right? So since all the modes are localized, uh, things can't uh, go across the system, okay? So that's why you see that uh, most of the modes, uh, they're not carrying, like at every frequency, there's no transmission. Uh, as you go to bigger and bigger system size, okay? So at small frequencies, something different happens, and that you can see from here. At small frequencies, like, uh, I mean, you can see the effect of disorder becomes less, okay? So therefore, uh, uh, if you go to lower frequencies, if you plot the normal modes, basically they would look something like, uh, maybe something like that, okay? So they're still kind of extended at very low frequencies, okay? So now there's a sort of, uh, uh, there's a, a sort of the only exact calculation that's known is uh, so this all this uh, thing uh, I mean uh, how these things are localized and so on so we need to know have some idea of what is the scale of localization how does it depend on frequency okay so one uh, result that's known kind of rigorously is that uh, okay so we had that uh, uh, this uh, we had this two cross two matrix and we wrote it in terms of this product of uh, random matrices. Right, and then uh, the, the, this first element of this uh, random matrix is this element D1n, uh, which basically appears in the denominator, right? So now uh, uh, there's a, uh, uh, so there's a, uh, so this is a different, so you have studied about random matrices in the last week, which was taking n cross n matrices and looking at properties, okay? So this is a different uh, uh, theory. This is product of uh, random matrices. Like you have finite matrices, but you take a product of many of them, okay? And try to find, uh, ask what are the properties. Okay, so uh, I mean, I don't think too much is known about uh, such systems, but one thing that is known rigorously is for the kind of matrices I constructed, uh, where uh, the structure is this. There, uh, what is known is that for large n, uh, you can show that this D1n uh, grows exponentially with system size. Uh, and then there's some uh, localization length which depends on frequency. Uh, is this right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So this is uh, the, so what it says is that uh, this transmission, uh, therefore, because transmission is one over this object, right? So it will decay exponentially as you increase system size. Uh, and this, uh, there's a uh, localization length, and this is known to grow as uh, one over omega square. Uh, 
Okay. So this is uh, kind of the localization length. You can think of this as the localization length. So at small frequencies, this kind of diverges. Okay. So therefore, uh, I mean, then you can have, uh, they can really transmit through the system. And uh, so we uh, basically find that this uh, goes as e to the power minus n omega square. Okay. So then what we uh, need, to, so at for sufficiently large n, we just need to look at frequencies which are kind of order 1 by root n. Right. So only frequencies root n will uh, transmit energy. Okay. So basically what I'm saying is uh, if you take large n, then uh, I mean this, the area, uh, the region which is transmitting uh, just goes as 1 by square root n. Right. Okay. So therefore I, uh, this, uh, uh, so then we just need to do this integral uh, d omega 0 to 1 by root n of uh, transmission. And uh, now there's a difference between the two uh, different models of Bath. Okay. So for this particular model, you find that at small omega, it's omega square. While for this other model, you find it goes as omega to the power 0, right? Omega. I mean, it's independent of omega. So therefore, uh, for the two models, uh, so I'll call the first, uh, so this, uh, this result was first uh, obtained by Kasher and Leboitz. So the first model is uh, basically kasher leboitz model. And uh, there uh, tau omega goes as omega square at small omega. And so this integral, uh, so you put in omega square and do integral, then you get uh, 1 over into the power 3 by 2. Right? So j goes as 1 over n to the power 3 by 2. And the second model, uh, so this was uh, uh, first uh, studied by Rubin and Greer. So there tau omega goes as uh, 1 at, uh, it's just flat, right, at uh, small omega. So you get j goes as 1 by n to the power half. OK, so. Uh, Okay, so in this uh, original papers, I mean, they had some, uh, they didn't really uh, derive this. They had some rigorous bounds uh, saying that this has to be less than uh, something and so on. Uh, this result was, I mean, like in, I think, around two, 2015, it was uh, like proved mathematically rigorously. And this also has been proved uh, rigorously much before, okay, around 79. Okay, so these are both rigorous results, but you can physically understand how, uh, that's what I tried to explain, that how you get uh, these results. Uh, okay, so I still have uh, 34 minutes, uh, which is good. Uh, so, any questions? No. Okay, so I'll assume everything is clear. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 so okay. Then you can one question, of course, is like what happens in higher dimensions, right? I mean. Uh, uh, do you get Fourier's law in if you put a disordered uh, uh, system? Yeah. No, omega square d omega, so omega cube, and omega goes as 1 by root n. So, ah, okay. and 1 by 2 root. Okay, so, uh, so, I mean, let me just state the results for higher dimensions. Uh, so, if you take, like, uh, I mean, uh, you can imagine, uh, for example, in two dimensions, a crystal like that. Right, and then you put uh, heat baths uh, at uh, these two ends. And uh, then actually you can, uh, of course, this formalism is still valid, everything you can do. And uh, only thing, you don't have, uh, you don't have results like uh, this, okay. So you, you can again write it as a product of matrices which go from layer to layer, okay. So it's some sort of transfer matrix, uh, you can uh, write that, uh, yeah. but then there are no uh, rigorous results on that. Uh, so we had studied this numerically at some point, and uh, what we uh, found is that the uh, only case where you get Fourier's law is in uh, is in uh, uh, three dimensions uh, with uh, if you put pinning. Okay, so three dimensions uh, pinning plus disorder.
gives uh, Fourier's law. Uh, if you don't put pinning, which is the more natural situation, uh, then what you find is uh, So you still find that uh, it's anomalous transport. Uh, this is OK. So in uh, 3D, again, you can ask uh, like what happens to localization. So in 3D, I mean, effect of disorder is much more weak. So in 1D, I said all states are localized, except the very low frequency modes. In 2D, also similarly, uh, I mean, it's weaker. Localization is slightly weaker, but still all states get localized. Uh, and, but in 3D, uh, you have a finite band of uh, extended states. Uh, which are kind of diffusive, okay? And, uh, but this divergence again comes from the low frequency modes, uh, which uh, you can imagine that uh, at very low frequencies, it, it looks like weak disorder, okay? Because uh, the, the disorder comes as ML times omega square. So if ML, omega is very small, uh, so it's like long wavelengths, then you don't see the disorder, the disorder kind of looks weaker. And there, if you do some kinetic theory kind of calculations, uh, you can sort of uh, argue, uh, see that you get this uh, power. Okay, so uh, that's uh, understood from there. Yeah, pinning is the like I, initially I said uh, I wrote the potential. There was a term like xi, and then there was a term which was xi minus xi plus one. Okay, I mean, if you take a real crystal, there's no pinning, right? Because it's uh, it, there's just interparticle forces. I mean, unless you have like an optical trap or something, then it's really pinned. But usually, there's no pinning in a physical problem. Uh, okay, so that's uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Ah, okay, so good question. So in one D, uh, if you have pinning, uh, then. Yeah, so then see, if you have pinning, then there are no low frequency modes, right? The spectrum starts at some, diff uh, like, uh, there's a gap in the spectrum. So no low frequency, so what do you expect? Huh? No transmission, no transmission. but uh, how should it depend on system size? Anyone wants to make a guess? <laughs> and from what I said, it's, uh, I already said it, right? I mean, if every state is localized, I mean, if I uh, like try to send energy, how much can go? I mean, if, if, like, uh, see, the basically, I mean, if uh, this uh, typical states look like this, okay, and uh, the strength of this wave function out here is like exponentially small, right? So basically, it will be exponential in system size. So uh, for uh, in 1D uh, crystal J goes as e to the power minus n. Okay, and uh, you can kind of estimate what this should be. That's it's the uh, uh, yeah okay, but it's uh, this and so this you'd call an insulator. Okay, so the uh, so the next thing I'll do now is uh, basically we'll get rid of disorder, uh, but uh, I uh, so I said another uh, nice model is the harmonic chain with noise. Okay, so noise means not disorder, but uh, some additional uh, uh, processes uh, uh, like random processes, uh, which will make the system kind of uh, ergodic. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so uh, no disorder. Okay, just so just forget the pre whatever I said in the previous. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now uh, so basic idea is uh, if we take harmonic chain. Uh, 
Uh, then, uh, so this system is, uh, okay, so it's, so mass is, let's say, one, all one, and then half, And this uh, basically is like, uh, if you go to normal modes, it basically becomes like a bunch of uh, uncoupled oscillators. Uh, <coughs> right, where omega q square is to Okay, so if, I mean this harmonic chain, you can just diagonalize the thing, and you, it looks like uncoupled oscillators uh, with frequencies given by this n uncoupled oscillators. And uh, of course, it's a system which doesn't thermalize, right? If you put in some energy, it will just stay in. Uh, if you put energy in one mode, it will just stay in that mode. Okay, so it's a bad system from point of thermodynamics, and uh, it, is, it has large number of. So each of these mode energy is a constant of motion. It has n constants of motion. It's one example, it's a trivial example of an integrable system. Okay, so you don't expect good uh, transport properties, right? So one way you can imagine, uh, of course, we said that if you put anharmonicity, you expect uh, uh, like it to behave better, but then it, it's very hard to solve, right? Once you put anharmonicity, you can't do anything analytically. Uh, so, uh, one idea was to uh, kind of uh, put something which mimics anharmonicity, okay. So, and what anharmonicity does, it introduces interaction between the modes. So, one way the, that uh, these people, uh, so the first paper was uh, Basil, I don't remember the reference, but it's uh, PRN2002. Okay, this, uh, you'll find it in my review. Uh, this is the reference. Okay, so what they propose is that you introduce some uh, extra process, stochastic process. So there's the Hamiltonian dynamics, uh, which is usually uh, x double dot equal to whatever. And in, on top of that, you I introduce some exchanges. Okay, so uh, with some rate lambda, uh, so with uh, rate lambda, uh, pick a pair of uh, party, uh, sites pk and uh, pk plus one, just pick up two neighbors and uh, just uh, take them to uh, pk plus one, pk. So just exchange their momentum. Okay, and uh, don't do anything to the position, just exchange momentum. Okay, so then uh, if you look at it, you'll see that all these constants of motion are destroyed. The only thing that still remains constant are, uh, so, so this ensures that uh, constants of motion are energy, okay, which is just the Hamiltonian, uh, total momentum, because uh, total momentum was already conserved. Now, when you exchange, of course, it's going to be conserved. So total momentum is conserved. And of course, number of particles uh, and uh, or the volume of the system, okay. So, Okay, so this I'm just writing this, uh, it's, it will be useful in the next class. So this is a stretch variable, which is uh, just the distance between particles. And uh, if you sum over it, it's the length of the system, <coughs> which is of course a conserved quantity. Okay, so it looks like a trivial conserved quantities, but uh, just like number of particles, but it's important when you do hydrodynamics, okay. So we'll just uh, look at this. Uh, so there are three conserved quantities, okay. And this, of course, also I can write as sum over, we saw in the previous class that you can write it as sum of local objects, okay. So each of these conserved quantities, there are three conserved quantities, each of them is like a sum of local objects. Okay, so the three conserved quantities, and now you find that if you, uh, if you even take the isolated system and uh, uh, let it evolve, it will reach uh, thermal equilibrium. Okay, so now we want to, uh, uh, again, study the open system. Let's say you can put heat baths and uh, then look at the dynamics. 
And uh, if you look at, uh, like yesterday, we wrote the Fokker-Planck equation. And uh, now, uh, we, uh, so there, of course, we could write a Fokker-Planck because of the baths, right? Stochastic process. Uh, that's why you could write a Fokker-Planck. Uh, and now you have additional process, uh, this exchanges, so we'll have some extra term in the Fokker-Planck. Okay, so the Fokker-Planck uh, basically looks like, again, same thing, Q1. Uh, x n t 1 to p n t is equal to, there's a, uh, so there's the usual Hamiltonian part, plus there's some term which comes from the left reservoir, so L1 p, uh, so let's call it left reservoir, and then there's some part coming from the right reservoir, uh, so these things we wrote yesterday, and uh, then now there's some, this exchange process which basically should look like uh, plus, uh, this happens with some rate lambda, and I have to just sum over all uh, pairs, and uh, then I, uh, so the rate at which the, a particular configuration will uh, will arrive is, uh, should be something like P x1 to xn, P1, P k plus 1, P k, uh, and then there's a loss term. Okay, so this this is some term with just pk and pk plus one flipped, and whenever uh, this process occurs with rate lambda, I arrive at uh, this configuration, right? So that's the rate at which this is increasing, and then this is the loss term. If it was this, at it it can happen, uh, the p1, p2 can get exchanged, and so I lose uh, prob probability. So this is uh, the so equation just changes to this. Okay, and now again I can do the same thing that I did yesterday. Uh, you can write equations for the correlations. Okay, so you just multiply this by uh, xi, xj, pi, xi, pj, and all those things. And uh, you have a correlation matrix that I wrote yesterday, uh, which, uh, so define the correlation matrix, which is uh, x, x correlations, xz correlations, and uh, pp correlations. Sorry, xp. Uh, Okay, and uh, so for this uh, correlation matrix, you again get an equation, which uh, from these terms, you get the same terms. So that will be uh, what I called as A, A C minus C A transpose, and then there was a plus D from the, uh, so this is uh, because of heat baths, I had a D term, which doesn't involve C. Uh, this is the other term. And then from this ones, uh, again, you can see that it will still be, uh, it doesn't involve higher order correlations. Okay, clearly if I uh, multiply any term xi, xj or whatever, this will just involve two point correlations, okay. So this will be again some, uh, I, so I won't write explicitly, but it will be some matrix, uh, I mean some, uh, it just involves the correlations, not three point correlations, okay. So, uh, there's some matrix form. Okay, so again it's a linear equation and uh, now, uh, you can either uh, do time dependent properties or you can try to look at steady state properties. And uh, so again, I won't go through the details. Uh, okay, how much time? 16 minutes, okay. I'll just, uh, uh, I mean, this is a slightly complicated formalism, so I'll just, uh, okay, it's not very complicated, but it's, uh, okay, it takes time. Uh, so I'll just basically de describe the basic idea, okay. So the idea is that uh, what people s uh, found is that, okay, so this, you have some equations in uh, uh, this uh, object. So these are variables defined on the lattice sites. So I, J, okay, so what is this? Uh, hmm. Okay, so let me just say that, uh, let's say you write this matrix as uh, three terms, U, Z, this is Z transpose, and V. Okay, so these four blocks, I just define them as U, Z, uh, Z transpose, and V. Okay, so now uh, the diagonal elements of this uh, V are basically the t uh, temperature, right? So V, I, I is basically temperature, right? Because that's uh, V, I square. So that's what I call the temperature. Uh, and uh, some element like maybe Z, I, uh, I plus one, uh, that is, uh, the, that's going to be the current, okay. 
that because it's like ui into pi plus one or something so that will give me the current uh, on a bond i okay so uh, so these are the physical variables and but then uh, there's information about all the other correlations okay so what you can do is uh, 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 let's say you can write some equations that involve uh, i mean you can sort of eliminate all the various degrees and finally you can arrive at an equation just for uh, this uh, T variable and Z variable. These are two fields, right? In this space of IJ. So IJ goes from, or the site indices. And uh, so I have some, uh, you can just imagine there's some lattice. Uh, this is I, uh, which goes from 1 to N. And this is J, which goes from 1 to N. Okay. So along the diagonal is basically the, it's a kind of I equal to J. So that's uh, along the, a, a, a length of the chain. Okay, so what you can do is uh, you can define, uh, okay, so you can, uh, let's say you define, uh, okay, so what you find, uh, okay, it's kind of a numerical observation, but what you find is that this uh, j as a function of ij uh, has a scaling form, uh, which is like 1 over, okay, and then this time, uh, uh, which has a scaling form, which is uh, 1 over, Okay, so this is uh, something you just ob observed, like, uh, let's say, empirically. Uh, okay, there's also some, like, you can just look at the equations, uh, you just do the scaling, and you see that you get some uh, uh, re reasonable equations for the uh, scaling functions, okay? So, which means that you, the scaling makes sense, okay? So, you can try different kinds of scaling, and then you will find that this is the only scaling which uh, if you start from these equations, uh, it gives you like re reasonable uh, 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 scaling properties, okay? So if you do this scaling and similarly for the temperature field, uh, okay, so temperature just depends on a single variable, uh, which is let's say I, uh, uh, I by N, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, this just behaves as, uh, uh, it just depends on I by N. Okay, so uh, then uh, what you can, uh, so let's call this variable as uh, y and this variable as u uh, or x and uh, this variable as tau. Okay, so then uh, these discrete equations uh, transform to linear partial differential equations in these variables x, y, tau. Okay. So, uh, so I'll just write down the equations that you get. Uh, so the basic steps is to somehow uh, like do this discretization and uh, uh, do some expansions. It's like uh, if you start from uh, discrete walk to diffusion equation, the same kind of uh, uh, discretization and uh, continuum uh, limit you have to take, you have to do the same thing. Uh, and uh, but these are the scaling fun uh, variables you should use. Okay, so then what you find eventually is that you get equations of the form. Okay, so I'll just define another function c of i j t, which is uh, some symmetrized symmetrized form of this. Uh, so it's, it's z i j plus uh, z j i. Okay, so you get some equations for C and tau, which uh, basically looks like uh, lambda square.
Okay, so this looks uh, a bit complicated, but the main point is that these are linear uh, differential, partial differential equations, right? And uh, this last equation, uh, you can see it's like, uh, so finally you want to arrive at diff diffusion equation for temperature, right? So this left-hand side is what you want, like uh, how does temperature evolve with time, and why is really the position on the chain. Uh, and this has the form of a, uh, like a continuity equation where this looks like current, right? So omega squared times C, uh, this really is the current, it's because this came from this correlation Z. Uh, and Z i i plus one is really the current, right? So that's why you can see that, okay, so this has the form of a continuity equation for the temperature field. Okay, so now what you can do is uh, this equation can like, uh, let's say, uh, okay, so right now you, can, you can't see where the bath is. That has to come in as uh, uh, like boundary conditions when you solve this equation. But supposing you solve it on the infinite line, okay. So you can uh, do this uh, even for the open, uh, like for the closed uh, system where there are no reservoirs. But let's say you are on the infinite line and you want to see how a temperature, uh, initial temperature profile evolves, okay. So that is the simpler case. And uh, then uh, what you can do is the way you can solve this equation is just taking Fourier transforms, okay. So if you just do Fourier transforms, and uh, this is, uh, I won't do, I'll give you a reference. Uh, what you'll find eventually is that uh, this T, uh, so let's say T Y tau uh, is, uh, has a Fourier transform T tilde K tau, Okay, so now I'm discussing the infinite uh, system. Okay, so uh, you can also discuss the finite uh, system with the boundary conditions, but the infinite system is easier. So, I mean, infinite. Uh, okay, so okay, so in this case, it just turns out that C. Okay, you can uh, like it's just coupled to the T. So you solve for T, and you find what uh, like uh, I mean, it just follows the. So this will also give you the time evolution of C. So if you solve these equations consistently, you get solution both for T and C. Okay, but I just worry about T because C is not a very interesting object except uh, at the boundary, which gives me the current. But uh, basically, I just look at C, okay. So if I take this Fourier transform, then what you'll find is that uh, in, uh, okay, so T tilde KT is basically uh, some constant, induce this constant, okay. Then uh, K to the power three by two T tilde K tau. Okay, so you, uh, if it was diffusive, you would get K square. Right, but here you get k mod to the power three by two. Okay, so this uh, now uh, this means uh, if you solve this, uh, you get t tilde k tau equals to e to the power minus c. Right, uh, this is what you get. Uh, assuming, if, let's say, you try start from a delta function. Uh, then this is the solution. So instead of getting e to the minus, so diffusive, so just remember that uh, for diffusive system, uh, so which means del t, uh, t equals to, if you take Fourier transform, you get del t, t tilde equals to minus t k square t tilde. Right, so t tilde would be e to the power minus t k square t. Okay, so this is what you get, but now you get something different. And this, uh, so if you take uh, inverse Fourier transform, do you know what is this function called? Uh, this uh, I'm sure people have seen. I, I don't know if they, maybe Sanjeev's class he taught this. Uh, no, maybe not. Uh, okay. Uh, huh? Yeah. So this is uh, see, there are the stable distributions. I mean, uh, this is one of the stable distributions. Okay. So uh, I mean, uh, 
is equal to uh, so basically to the uh, And so this is the Levy Okay, and so what does it look like? Uh, so this Levy distribution. Uh, so the big difference is that uh, okay. Uh, so let's say this is uh, this is the Gaussian. Uh, now uh, Gaussian, of course, decays very fast. The Levy it has like uh, at uh, so I'm plotting t of x versus uh, x at any given time. Okay, so Gaussian would look like this. Levy has uh, like very long tails, uh, so it basically uh, has a power law tail. Uh, I, I so at large x, it just goes as 1 over x to the power uh, by two. 5 by 2. Uh, for this particular case and uh, okay so the other uh, uh, thing is that it, it has if you look at compute the second moment it's infinite okay so then there's some subtlety it shouldn't be infinite because uh, if you put a heat pulse it should have a finite uh, so, uh, i mean it should have some finite support okay so there will be some subtle changes that we'll discuss uh, uh, later but uh, this is one important that you think you find that uh, yeah, heat transport in this model uh, basically is uh, you can sh it, it you can basically prove it rigorously that uh, the diffusion equation is not satisfied, but you get a what's known as a fractional diffusion equation. Okay, so uh, I mean in real space uh, sometimes people just write uh, T of x T is equal to uh, so no, instead of writing del x square uh, you can write something like uh, uh, so Laplacian and then uh, Three by four of t. Okay, so uh, I mean this is difficult to make meaning, uh, except it's easiest to make meaning if you go to uh, Fourier space. Okay, so in real space, if you write a fractional derivative, uh, it doesn't make much sense. But uh, it's, you should really think of it in Fourier space, then it's uh, sensible. Okay, the other thing it means is that uh, what you can do is also uh, now that you have this equation. Uh, you can, uh, okay, so supposing you just, uh, I uh, go back to real space, okay. So, uh, so I look at this equation and uh, integrate over uh, k and get uh, in real space. Then you see that this has the form t of uh, x tau is equal to, I have to uh, minus c Okay, so I want to write it in terms of uh, both sides. I want to write a, uh, like x. Okay, so uh, so how would I do this? If I want to write everything in terms of x, okay, so I should just, uh, so if it was k square, then you can quickly see that you can, instead of k square, you can just uh, write it as uh, del del, uh, two derivatives of x, and then you get, uh, uh, you basically get back this. Okay, if it was k square. But now it's k to the power three by two. Uh, so you can still take one derivative out and uh, get something like, uh, so this will go down to half, and uh, maybe you get a del del x here. Right, and then there's an i factor maybe, so you get an extra i. This is fine, right? So if I take del del x, I get uh, i k, uh, so i k into uh, i is minus k, so then I would get back k to the word 3 by 2. Right, so I get back uh, del del x of something, uh, and uh, so this is, uh, so now I expect, of course, that continuity should always hold. So basically, this is my current. Okay, so this is like, this has the form del del x of j of x. Okay, so this is the current. And now question is, uh, can I write it as j is, uh, in Fourier's I would say j is proportional to uh, kappa grad t. Can I write something similar? Okay. So uh, to do that, what I, what uh, okay? So we have now j at x uh, t uh, is equal to this object, which has i c. Okay, I'll just take last one minute. Uh, then k to the power half. Uh, 
Okay, so this uh, what I can do is now I can uh, rewrite this as uh, in Fourier space. I, I can t t uh, write it as another integral. So dy it will be i k y uh, t of y t. Right. So I just wrote. Uh, so this is what I had, but I re re rewrite it like that. Okay, so now uh, I what I see is that this is as the form integral dy, uh, and then maybe so this should be minus, uh, and then uh, okay, there's some constants here, but uh, this is this looks like dk k to the power half, and uh, then there's e to the power i k x minus y. Uh, uh, that's it, right? And then tyt. Okay, so this is uh, this. Uh, and then uh, what I can do again is I can again take out a del del y. Right? I, I can, uh, uh, so th this I can make k minus half into k. Uh, and then uh, I can put a del del y. Okay, and then if I do a partial integration, I can take it here. Okay, so because I want to write it as something proportional to into gradient of temperature. Okay, so I just uh, uh, wrote it like that, and then I do a partial integration and I bring it here. Okay, so I hope this is uh, clear. Okay, so I get something like this. Now I can uh, do this integral, right? And what you notice is that uh, you get dy. Uh, this integral, it uh, basically you can scale out uh, x and y, and it looks like 1 by x minus y to the power half del y t y tau. Okay, so the, the okay, so now the main point is uh, this you can think of as there's some kernel x minus y mod. Okay, so instead of uh, getting k, yeah, question? No. Okay, so instead of getting uh, like uh, what we usually get at minus d of uh, del x t, we are getting that the response at a site depends on not just the local gradient, but gradients elsewhere, okay? And then there's uh, some kernel uh, which gives the response function. Okay, so it's a non-local response in some sense, okay? So therefore in this uh, systems with anomalous transport, uh, what you find is uh, it's a non uh, the uh, this non local response which is equivalent to like just writing this uh, equation uh, okay so the other thing that i didn't show is basically that uh, you can do this for the open system and for the open system uh, you get a similar equation but there's some subtle thing stuff which i won't go into this kernel kind of changes actually okay so uh, unlike the uh, diffusion equation whether you solve you solve the same diffusion equation whether you, you are in a closed geometry or an infinite geometry, right? But for uh, anomalous systems, uh, the, the, because boundary conditions, everything depends very sensitive to boundary conditions. Okay, so this kernel completely changes if you are in a uh, finite geometry. But uh, uh, in some particular case, we can uh, like, okay, so you get some equation like this, and then uh, you can actually uh, put the boundary conditions and solve this equation. And uh, so, uh, so you basically find that uh, solving this equation gives you this kind of uh, nonlinear profiles. And uh, here you also can show that the current goes as 1 by uh, n to the power half. Okay. So, uh, so this is a system where you can kind of rigorously show this uh, sort of anomalous behavior in transport. So it's a good system with good ergodicity properties and everything. Uh, it has just three conservation laws that's uh, uh, physical systems, uh, but it has this funny temperature profile and then uh, this current goes as this, okay. So let me just write the references uh, for this. <coughs> Uh, okay, so the, uh, I'll just write one reference. Which is what? Okay, so this is Journal of Statistical Mechanics. Uh, okay, 
Okay, so this is a very new uh, recent paper. Uh, that's written by uh, people here and uh, people from various places. But uh, so there are uh, okay, there are five authors. So I, I won't write all the authors. Uh, so this is basically fractional. Uh, the title of the paper is fractional equation description of anomalous heat transport. So this is uh, of course not the first paper, but uh, you will get all the references uh, in this paper. Okay, it, like it has some kind of a review also. And uh, you can uh, kind of understand these uh, things both in the uh, open and closed uh, system geometries. Okay, uh, so tomorrow uh, we'll then go to hydrodynamics. Okay, so that's the.